Perfect. So, well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the first symposium of the year. I have to confess, I'm a little bit excited and maybe also a tiny bit nervous. Uh, my name is Sarah, who doesn't know me, and I'm currently working at the University of Padova. And I will be your housekeeper for this afternoon, basically. I will keep this opening very, very brief as, uh, uh, so as to reserve more time for our brilliant speakers and colleagues. But firstly, I'd like to thank very much all the people that made the MCLS 2021 possible who work relentlessly behind the scene to put the online program in place for another year. So let's officially start our symposium. And as you probably had the chance to see uh, on the abstract, this symposium will be based around emotional aspects reflected in a, a different target, uh, targeted population. Um, as three of today's talks will be focused on math anxiety, we have decided to tweak uh, the presentation order a little to start with a brief definition of this construct. So Christoph Chipora will now be the first in line to talk, followed by Serena Rossi and Rachel O'Connor, ending with Julia Krishin. As per usual, each talk will be uh, 10, 12 minutes long to leave you a few minutes for questions before moving on to the next speakers. If there is time at the end, we, may, we might have space for an additional and a brief q and moment, uh, of course. You also might want to use the chat to type your questions in case there is not enough time between presentations. So before kicking off, I would like to remind the speakers that I'm approaching uh, the 10 minutes mark and might switch on my microphone just to give you a quick friendly reminder of two minutes left. So without further ado, I'll leave the floor to Chris. Um, hi all, can you see me and hear me? Okay, so thanks so much for this uh, opportunity to, to present. And this is a project that uh, Sarah and I uh, have been like developing for some time already. And it kind of uh, hopefully grows and it's ready to, to, to show to the public. So it's about the uh, AMAS database and it's not like the typical empirical study, but rather like proposal of building a new resource that, that we could uh, hopefully all use in the uh, future. So let's start with mathematics anxiety. Uh, so this is like uh, the topic of my, uh, of my uh, talk, but also like important part of the whole symposium. So I just start with the definitions so that we are kind of setting the ground for the, for the whole session. So uh, when, uh, when we look at the literature, uh, we can find something that I would say like two groups of definitions of mathematics anxiety. One of them is like feeling of tension and anxiety that interferes with the manipulation of numbers and the solving of mathematical problems in ordinary, ordinary life and academic situations. This is like one of the oldest, uh, one of the oldest definitions from 70s. But the other one uh, is like more, I would say, at least my impression here is that it's more clinical. It's like irrational and impeditive dread of mathematics. And the next one also looks a little bit more kind of clinical of like panic, helplessness and paralysis and so on. Uh, and at the same time, other definitions were, are more discussing that mathematics anxiety is just like negative emotional states uh, that we experience now and then when encountering mathematics. So um, as I say, like, this is not very well, uh, I think, systematized in the literature, but this like implicit assumption appears now and then that it's more either clinical or more like individual characteristic, let's say. What is also important here is that uh, definitions and researchers uh, agree that mathematics anxiety could be related both to like academic context, like being tested in mathematics or learning new mathematical content, but it can also affect uh, daily life, for instance, like calculating uh, change or, or, or tip we are supposed to leave uh, when we are uh, like eating in a restaurant. Uh, what is also important is that uh, mathematics anxiety is distinct from both general anxiety and from low mathematics skills. 
And uh, how do we measure it? So uh, the most popular and uh, prevalent with like a much, uh, let's say, advantage over other methods is self-descriptive or self-descriptive measures, which are typically uh, characterized uh, by very, very good uh, psychometric properties. So usually reliabilities, uh, correlations, and so on are, are very, uh, with like external measures are very good. and. Um, there is kind of consensus that we can kind of reliably measure mathematics anxiety, even with a single question asking like, how math anxious are you? And like rate on the uh, scale from one to 10, it seems to be like sufficiently good measure. Um, however, um, most of the time people don't stick to a single item, but use a little bit longer instruments. And one of them is uh, AMAS, that is abbreviated math anxiety scale proposed by Hopka and colleagues in uh, 2003. And it's very, very simple. It's just nine, nine items. You can administer it within one minute. Uh, and um, it has very good uh, psychometric properties, as I said. It's like high, high uh, reliability, both in terms of internal consistency, test, retest reliability, or like uh, validity measures related to like how people uh, perform mathematics under uh, under pressure and so on so it's yeah i think rather rather good uh, good and freely available instrument which is another advantage of of this one but what are the current challenges in mathematics anxiety research so okay we have the construct we have like 50 years of of uh, quite intense investigations uh, but uh, in the end, we still don't know, uh, for instance, who is math anxious, about whom we can say that they are math anxious. Uh, actually, normative data for, uh, for mathematics and anxiety is also quite scarce. It's not very uh, well available that we can just use norms. They are like not available to all the instruments and so on. It's, it, it, things kind of get tricky at this point. And the other problem, uh, more from a research point of view than from a like, practical point of view for diagnostics, is comparability between studies. So if we have no norms, if we have no kind of agreement on prevalence of mathematics anxiety, uh, in studies, people just like screen some groups and then do either like just uh, the quartiles or extreme quartiles or even worse like median split and say, okay, this is like a high math anxious group, low math anxious group. But this in a consequence can lead to a situation that uh, like high math anxious group in study A can actually have uh, the same math as low math anxious uh, group in study B. And then like we can hardly compare the conclusions from these two. Uh, and this like seems obvious when we, when we try to think of the big picture, but it somehow disappears in uh, single studies. So who is math anxious? It's not a super easy answer, uh, question to answer. So when we look at the distribution of scores of AMAS that we can see here, for instance, from like a study that we conducted some time ago in Poland. Uh, yeah, if we, if we look uh, carefully enough, we can maybe see that it looks more or less like normal distribution, but certainly it's not a bimodal distribution. So we cannot say that there is a natural cutoff that like these people are math anxious and these aren't. So uh, we need to rely on a sort of statistical criterion. And then, of course, like the way we uh, set up the statistical criterion would also determine the prevalence estimates that we come up with. And what are the uh, typical uh, estimates or ideas like who is math anxious? So in some papers, we can find that even majority of uh, population might experience some negative feelings towards mathematics. Um, some other estimates uh, speak of like around 30% who might be kind of problem, might, might already perceive or encounter some problems with mathematics, some other uh, tell that it's closer to 11%. But in any case, uh, we know that we are kind of forced to use statistical criterion because there is no like natural cutoff. And of course, the statistical criterion, whichever we take uh, in the end and whichever we agree on, gets better and better if this uh, criterion and these cutoff values that we agree on is based on a large sample. Uh, and when it comes to norms, which are being scarce, as I said, like there were some uh, attempts to create some norms. Uh, like AMAS is good because it's also like uh, 
freely available. Therefore, it's like easier to, to, to like implement in practice. Uh, so Sarah has uh, provided some norms for uh, for Italian children. These were percentile norms. Uh, in a, in Polish study some time ago, we provided norms for secondary schoolers, high schoolers, adults for both paper and pencil administration, both percentile and standard norms. Uh, yeah, it's not so important here. If you are interested, just please refer to the paper. Um, but uh, then the big problem comes when it when we start thinking of the between study comparabil uh, comparability. So of course, as I said, it can happen that in one study, low math anxious group is in fact high has higher math anxiety than uh, like high math anxious group in the in, in study B. And this, of course, uh, when we want to make a big picture of like what are effects of mathematics anxiety on this or that. It kind of blurs the, the big picture if you want to whatever build a meta analysis or something like this. Um, and uh, the problem is also present when we think, okay, yeah, well, we don't want to compare groups. We want to do like correlational slash, slash regression study. Yeah, true. But for instance, if our sample is just very uniform at like high end of math anxiety, we might not find much like correlations because there is no variance. Same is true if it's like very low or even in the middle, but if the variance is small, then like our conclusions are also not very uh, valid and, and we can just like either miss the effects or, or get some artifacts. So uh, what can we do at least to try to, to, to overcome this problem is something which we call at the moment big AMAS database uh, because it's about AMAS and it's uh, meant and hoped to be big. Uh, so we want to build international database of raw, raw results of AMAS. Uh, we know that it was adapted in several countries and languages, so uh, it's a questionnaire that it's used, and there is lots of data around. This would allow us for further psychometric evaluation of the instrument, running like factor analysis, and also building norms for some specific groups, subgroups, and so on. And we could also use it as a sort of reference point if we want to compare like single experimental studies. Okay, yeah, well, they didn't find they didn't find effects of math anxiety yet, but like their variance was like very low. And if you look at the bigger picture, yeah, it was it was very narrow. Okay, then maybe maybe this is the reason. And in the long run, of course, if the if the idea gets the traction, it would be maybe possi even possible to check how math anxiety changes in time because for each study that we include, we not only provide the year of publication, but we also aim to provide the year at which in which the data was collected. So maybe we could find in the future, of course, some 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 cohort effects. So how does it look like? Uh, it's a OSF project which uh, comprises following parts. You can just uh, go to this uh, link. I shared the the slides on the tweet on Twitter, so we can like reach everything there. So we have like one data description uh, Excel sheet. Then we have some uh, row files with the data. We have also templates on how to organize these row files. And we also have scripts, which uh, are scripts which allow like merging those row files. So we just like download them all and then run a script called AMAS Merging R and it gives you like very nice summary table of what we have at the moment. Uh, and then it also, yeah, it's nothing super fancy in a sense that like just merging, cleaning the data, giving some basic psychometric characteristics, factor analysis, or also script for building norms. And you can also like select them, some subgroups and then like build norms for these. And what kind of data do we have there? Uh, so we have like auth uh, author of the, like the person who contributes the data, just identifier of the project, year of the data collection, language in which AMAS was administered, uh, format with the three options, uh, participant code, just numbers, then uh, gender, age, occupation, we have like a pre-specified categories, number of years of education, educational level, field of study, we also build some pre-specified categories, and then responses to AMAS items. Again, like relatively easy entry to, to like contribute your data there. Like, uh, yeah, probably that field of study can be uh, can be a little bit hassle to, to, to recode, but if you're testing only psychology students, then you're done, you just like fill in one column. And one minute, Chris. Okay, thank you. And uh, this is uh, like the metadata. So basically 
just more information whether this data was published where how to reach the person if you are particularly interested in this so it could be also like a sort of, of hub for like information that we want to uh to, to, to like connect people who, who do math anxiety research and so on yeah so this is how it looks uh you can also the, the osf project as i said is public so we can just have a look there uh where we are at the moment, so we have this like OSF thing, the data sets that we have, it's like 4,400 uh, participants, a little more than that from Poland, Germany, Italy, uh, French speaking, Belgium, oh, Italy is twice, uh, and UK, different age groups, the R scripts, the templates, and uh, also I want to just use my last 30 seconds to ask you and to invite you to, to, to contribute to this uh, uh, project and yeah, I think I did not extend time too much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Chris. I think we have time for just one question before to move on to the next talk. Let me check if there is no question at the moment on the chat. If you want, you can also just switch on your microphone and ask directly a question to, to Christoph. So I see if, now, so it's stop sharing. If no one has a, has a question, um, maybe just a question in general for everyone. If they want to contribute, do they get in touch with you or can they just, how can they contribute basically? Yeah, just like first get in touch and we find solutions. I mean, uh, my email address uh, was like is on the slides. You also probably some of you follow me on Twitter or know me, I'm kind of there, so. I can also write my email address here in the in the chat if anyone who wishes to. Uh, yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. I'll say actually that I was going to suggest you, Chris, to comment on that either. So I think we can move on with the next presentation now. Uh, and of course, if anyone, anybody else still have a question for Chris, drop them on the chat. So now um the next talk will be given by Serena. Serena, when uh, you are ready, you can start. Uh, you are now in presenters mode, so we can see your notes. And you're still muted. Perfect. Okay, yeah, Serena. Okay, sorry. Can you see my slide now? Yep. Okay, so hi everyone. I'm really glad to present this study today at uh, this symposium. Uh, this is a great collaboration between Loughborough University when I'm doing my PhD and the University of Tübingen in Germany. Uh, so, um, mathematics and society that has uh, been already defined by Christoph as an impact on mathematics learning situations and future uh, career choices. Indeed, there is this negative association between maths and society and maths performance, and this link seems to be uh, bidirectional uh, with uh, poor maths performance that uh, can trigger maths and society in some individuals. Uh, and uh, maths and society in turn can further uh, reduce their uh, mathematical performance. So uh, the literature has revealed several factors that uh, can uh, mitigate uh, this relationship and uh, such as individual characteristics or personal factors. And within them, uh, we can mention the uh, mathematics self-concept that has been defined as one's beliefs about their competence in mathematics. And this construct can be well explained by some statements uh, such as I am good at maths or I've always been good at maths. And uh, regarding mathematics uh, self-concept, we know that it is positively related to mathematics uh, performance, but negatively related to mathematics anxiety. And so this uh, suggests uh, that maybe maths uh, self-concept uh, may play a mediational role in the relationship uh, uh, between maths anxiety and maths performance. And uh, this assumption uh, was verified uh, uh, with primary school children, but uh, less is known on uh, uh, this mediational role uh, in uh, adults and specifically in university students. 
Uh, gender is uh, another important factor to consider. Indeed, uh, um, there is a significant uh, difference uh, in the level uh, of maths anxiety and maths self-concept uh, between men and women. Uh, indeed, women tend to show lower maths self-concept levels uh, compared to men, and uh, they show um, higher maths anxiety levels than, than men in adulthood, adolescence, and also in primary school age. However, uh, women and men uh, often perform similarly in mathematics. And despite it, uh, we also know that uh, women are often uh, underrepresented in the math intensive uh, science field. And so these uh, gender differences um, appear to stem from a variety of uh, psychological and socialization processes as well as uh, specific behaviors and actions, um, but also a mathematics gender stereotype. The, uh, it is this uh, false idea that uh, um, mathematics is for men, but not for women, and so that uh, uh, women are uh, worse in mathematics than men. Uh, what we were more interested uh, to um, investigate was the role of endorsement of the mathematics gender stereotype. That is the degree of agreement of uh, this false idea that mathematics is for men but not for women. And so this construct can be assessed uh, asking the level of agreement uh, on some statements uh, such as uh, uh, it is hard to believe a woman could be a genius in mathematics uh, or I would have more faith uh, um, in an answer um, uh, for a math problem solved by a man than a woman. So regarding the mathematics gender stereotype endorsement, we know that uh, in uh, women, uh, it is a predictor of uh, negative uh, to, um, attitudes towards mathematics uh, and possibly of uh, a lower involvement uh, in the mathematics related professions. But what about men? Indeed, uh, um, so far research on gender stereotype endorsement has uh, mainly focused on its effect in women. So the stereotyped group, uh, but less is known on its effect in the non-stereotype uh, uh, group, so in this case, men. And moreover, no previous uh, studies uh, investigated uh, the role of math gender stereotype endorsement on math society, uh, math self-concept uh, and arithmetic performance concurrently, and its uh, potential effect in women and men in a large sample size. So the aim of our study was to investigate the interactive um, relationship between mathematics gender stereotype endorsement, math society, and math self-concept, how they concurrently influence the university students' arithmetic performance, and, may, and also we were interested in investigating the role of gender in this relationship. So uh, the study consisted in uh, an online survey conducted in Germany at uh, the University of Tübingen. Indeed, uh, uh, this is a secondary data analysis uh, that we pre-registered in OSF. Uh, a total of 923 university students with a mean age of around 23 years, uh, uh, 23 years uh, were involved in the study. And during the survey, uh, participants were asked to uh, perform a speeded arithmetic task uh, comprising 40 operations to be completed with a time limit of two minutes. The mathematics anxiety was assessed using the Mars short questionnaire uh, comprising of uh, 30 uh, items divided in the two subscales, uh, that is the mathematics test anxiety subscale which refers to the anxiety of being evaluated in mathematics and the numerical anxiety subscale, uh, which refers to the fear or, or anxiety of using mathematics in everyday situations. Then math, math self-concept was assessed using the mathematical ability uh, subscale of the self-description questionnaire. And finally, the math gender stereotype endorsement uh, um, using the male domain subscale of a bigger questionnaire. So in this study, we use the structural equation model. And uh, I will briefly explain our, what the steps that we took. So since the confirmatory factor analysis for each construct in the entire sample, uh, based on the structure of these constructs existing in the literature, uh, did not reach um, a good fit to our data. 
with uh, the exception of arithmetic performance, uh, we decided to uh, test the measurement invariance across gender. Uh, in order to investigate whether um, these constructs were measured alike uh, in men and women. So in, in other words, uh, measurement in, invariance allows to examine uh, whether uh, respondents from different groups uh, interpret the same uh, measure in uh, a similar uh, conceptually similar way. Uh, so in the case that measurement invariance will not be achieved in uh, all the constructs, uh, this would mean that uh, the, these two groups, men and women, uh, cannot be compared on the basis of the scores uh, on the latent uh, variables. And so this uh, will go give us reason to consider men and women separately in the subsequent uh, data analysis. And so indeed, we didn't uh, find uh, measurement invariance in our constructs, uh, except for arithmetic performance. And so from this point on, we considered men and women separately for the subsequent data analysis. So we identified a baseline model for each construct uh, um, in, uh, in each gender. And with this, and with this baseline model, we uh, run a confirmatory factor analysis uh, comprising all the constructs in each gender. Uh, and uh, in this case, it is worth noting that uh, the baseline models um, for, for both gender, uh, the baseline model which best uh, fit our da data for maths anxiety uh, was the model uh, which considered maths anxiety as composed of uh, two uh, different uh, uh, latent variables that are the two subscales uh, um, comprised in the, in the questionnaire that we use. So the mathematics test anxiety subscale and the numerical uh, anxiety subscale. So we then proceeded to run structural equation models uh, in order to um, investigate, uh, um, at, yes, in structural equation models. And then we compared three different models for each gender in order to uh, investigate to which of this model was uh, uh, the one that best fit our data. The difference uh, between these uh, three models uh, uh, consisted in the different mediational role of mathematics uh, uh, self-concept in the relationship between maths anxiety and arithmetic performance. These are uh, the two models that we uh, found that best fit our data, uh, respectively in women and men. And I will explain um, the significant results uh, in the next uh, slide with uh, a simplified model to make the, the results uh, clearer. And so what we found is that uh, in women, maths gender stereotype endorsement uh, um, affects uh, the level of mathematics anxiety. While in men, uh, maths gender stereotype endorsement affects uh, just the numerical anxiety component uh, of maths anxiety. On the contrary, in, uh, in men, we found that maths gender stereotype endorsement positively, even if uh, weakly, affects the, uh, their level of mathematics self-concept. In both genders, uh, we found that the maths anxiety negatively affects the level of maths self-concept, which in turn uh, positively affect the level of arithmetic performance. Arithmetic performance was also directly influenced by uh, maths anxiety, but uh, only by the numerical anxiety component of maths anxiety and only uh, in women. So um, to summarize our results, we found no measurement invariance in the considered constructs across gender, uh, except for arithmetic performance. And so this means that uh, men and women uh, do not interpret the same measures uh, conceptually in a similar way. So despite these results were a bit unexpected, especially for maths anxiety and maths self-concept, uh, our results demonstrate that it is important to check uh, for measurement invariance when investigating uh, gender emotional related aspects. Uh, and even when uh, using a standardized measure. Then we, with uh, structural equation models, we found that math gender stereotype endorsement influences the level of arithmetic performance, both through a different mediational pattern uh, across gender. 
Uh, indeed, we found that in women, in women, a gender stereotype endorsement uh, was linked to higher maths anxiety, but not to uh, mathematics uh, self-concept. While in men, we found this weak link between my gender stereotype endorsement and my self concept, and with my anxiety, but only with the numerical component. So, uh, the influence of the mathematics gender stereotype endorsement that we found, especially in women, could be one of the possible extra explanations for which um, women often show. Uh, mathematics, higher uh, level of mathematics uh, anxiety. Indeed, uh, we can hypothesize that the continuous exposure to uh, the mathematics gender stereotype uh, during childhood could lead the girl, uh, girls to endorse uh, this uh, construct, and maybe this could uh, contribute to enhance the, their level of mathematics uh, anxiety. So to conclude, um, based on our results, we can say that uh, mathematics gender stereotype endorsement is harmful to women, but either neutral or slightly positive uh, uh, for men. And so uh, we can maybe speculate that uh, mathematics gender stereotype endorsement uh, can be one of the reasons uh, for the gender differences in the mathematics uh, related emotional aspects and maybe potentially for the underrepresentation of women in the math intensive science field. So uh, given the importance that can have this uh, construct, uh, um, what we can say is that uh, we probably should enhance the, um, increase the, the awareness of this mathematics, uh, of this construct. And uh, especially uh, one of the future direction could be uh, to further investigate it, uh, maybe in a developmental perspective. Indeed, uh, uh, it could be, given our results, it could be really important to understand at uh, what age children and adolescents uh, begins uh, to endorse the mathematics uh, uh, gender stereotype. This in order to develop uh, intervention or at least carry out educational practices uh, to avoid it. Uh, it. And this uh, maybe can uh, have uh, could break off the cascading effect that uh, endorsement can have in educational settings and maybe in future career choices. Thank you. Thank you, Serena. Thank you very much to stay out some time in your presentation. We have just the time for a question for, for Serena. Thank you, Rachel, clapping. <laughs> So if there is no one, I have a, um, a curiosity for you, Serena. Thank you again for the very interesting talk and also the very complex analysis that you present. And um, uh, I was puzzled a bit about uh, your, uh, the fact that you didn't find a measurement invariance across gender. And I was wondering how did you explain these results so the fact that men and women do not interpret the measures at the same time especially also in in a perspective of future direction that you you were suggesting right now to probably move these studies in a younger in a young population uh well uh we tried to explain it uh, and uh, for instance for mathematics anxiety and math self-concept uh, uh, these results were not so expected because uh, previous studies uh, found uh, measurement invariance uh, using the questionnaires that uh, also we used our explanation in this case that probably in the um, it is a cultural or language um, uh, variance and difference in the sense that the formats anxiety, the mass uh, short questionnaire um, was standardized with Austrian um, German uh, speakers. When while we um, used it with German uh, speakers, so probably there could be a slight, uh, a slightly difference, mm -hmm. a cultural difference. Uh, but of course, we it, needs to be further investigated. For mathematics, gender stereotype endorsement was uh, less uh, surprising in the sense that the questions that uh, um, we posed to the participants uh, were uh, tightly gender related. 
So the gender men or women um, was uh, in some way uh, named in the questions. So in this case, uh, um, participants had to uh, come to term to the gender that, that they, in which they belong, belong and uh, reply to this, um, um, based on this uh, and also thinking about their in-group and out-group. So um, I think that uh, this uh, can be a possible explanation for this uh, non-measurement. Thank you. Thank you very much, Serena. We now need to swiftly move on to the next presentation. I'm now ending over to Rachel. Rachel, when you're ready. Your mic, perfect. Um, so I'm Rachel from the Math Thinking and Learning Lab at Florida State University. And today I'm going to be talking about our work on whether teacher math anxiety relates to student math anxiety. Or I would be if my keyboard was working. Here we go. Um, so as we have kind of discussed the um, definition of math anxiety, I'm not going to go into it, but what we know about math anxiety is that it develops early and it's pretty stable over development. Um, and as Serena already talked about, the relation between math anxiety and math achievement is pretty well documented at this stage. And when we're thinking about math anxiety, it's important to think that it not only affects math learners, but also math teachers. And so within teachers, um, we know that elementary education majors have one of the highest levels of math anxiety. And among elementary teachers, it's highest in early elementary school teachers. And so it's important to remember for elementary school teachers particularly, that they have to teach all the subjects. So they're typically not subject specialists. And so it may be that math is just one subject that they're not as confident in. And this is supported by um, work that came out this year that Christoph actually worked on, which showed that for female elementary school teachers, those who were math subject specialists experienced lower math anxiety than those that were not. So this kind of um, suggests that this lack of specialization might be involved. When we're considering math anxiety in teachers, not only do we have to think about their anxiety about doing math, but we also have to think about a second component, which is their anxiety about teaching math. Um, and we need to consider that as well. So knowing that teachers do experience math anxiety, that kind of leads us on to the next logical question of whether or not that anxiety is impacting their students. And past research has shown a relation between teacher math anxiety and student math achievement. So um, in 2010, Bailak et al found that for female first and second grade students or first and second grade teachers, so those are teachers of students around six to eight years old, that there was a relation between teacher anxiety and girls math anxiety, but not boys. More recently, Schaefer et al tried to replicate that study in a much bigger sample and they found the relation not only for girls, but for boys too. And Ramirez et al had similar findings for older students, so around 14 or 15 years old. And knowing this, we have to think about some potential mechanisms that might explain this relation. And there are lots of potential explanations, but knowing that student math anxiety is linked to student math achievement, one possible explanation is that teachers might pass on their anxiety to their students, and then this subsequently influences their math achievement. And while lots of people have hypothesized this, very few people have actually tested it. So back in 1989, a small study by Bush found no relation between teacher and student math anxiety in fourth to sixth grade students in the US. But more recently, a much larger study by Richland et al in Belize found a small but significant relation between teacher and student math anxiety for students who are around age eight to 15. And so this suggests that teacher math anxiety could be a potential area for intervention. What's really great about teacher interventions is that if you can move the needle for one teacher, you can potentially impact a large number of students. 
So it can be a really helpful way to intervene on a large scale. So this led us to our research question, which was whether teachers' anxiety about doing or teaching math at the beginning of the school year relates to students' math anxiety at the end of the school year. So in our study, we had 230 elementary school teachers. Most of them were female. They were split pretty evenly between kindergarten, first, second, and third grade. And it was a predominantly white sample. We also had their 2,808 students. About half were female. The sample was more racially diverse than for the teachers. And about half qualified for free or reduced lunch, which we use here as a proxy for socioeconomic status. We collected the data in two waves in fall 2018, which was the beginning of the school year, and again in spring 2019, which was the end of the school year. So in terms of our teacher measures, the teachers completed all of their measures in the fall. So we measured their math anxiety using the math anxiety scale for teachers. And this scale captures both of those components of teacher math anxiety. So they look at general math anxiety with items like, I would start to panic if I have to solve challenging math problems. And then also that anxiety about teaching math. So those items are things like, it makes me nervous to solve a math problem in front of my class if I haven't already figured out the solution. And teachers responded to this on a five point scale from not at all true of me to very true of me. We also included some teacher level covariates in our model. So we looked at math knowledge for teaching, which was measured by the K team. So this is a scale that assesses various aspects of math knowledge for teaching. So things like problem solving, reasoning, and content knowledge. We also took into account how long they've been teaching and the grade that they taught. So in our model, um, we dummy coded grade and we use kindergarten as our reference variable. In terms of student measures, the outcome that we were interested in was their math anxiety in the spring. So we use the math anxiety scale for young children revised, which has items like when it's time for math, my head hurts. And they could respond, no, not really, kind of, or yes. In terms of student level covariates, we were looking at their level of math anxiety in the fall, their gender, and that SES proxy of free or reduced lunch. So all of that went into a multi-level model that looked something like this. So in green, I have all of the teacher level variables. And in blue, I have the student level variables. And because there's a bunch of lines here, um, I'm just going to look at it in chunks. So it's not too overwhelming. Um, so we're going to start with the teacher level covariates. So what we found was that there was no relation between any of the teacher level covariates and the student's spring math anxiety. However, when we looked at the student level covariates, um, we did have some significant relations. So like you might expect, students who were more anxious in the fall were also more anxious in the spring. We also found that um, girls were more math anxious than boys, um, which you would expect based on uh, Serena's work. And then we also found that um, low SES students had more math anxiety than high SES students. So no real surprises there. But moving on to the main outcomes that we were interested in. Um, first of all, when we consider teachers' anxiety about doing math, we found no relation between this anxiety and student math anxiety. And similarly, there was no relation between teachers' anxiety about teaching math and the student math anxiety. And indeed, these p-levels are very high. Um, so to sum up, uh, neither teacher's anxiety about teaching math or their anxiety about doing math relates to students' math anxiety in early elementary school. So this is consistent with what Bush found, but it's contrary to that uh, larger study by Richland. We also found that only student level covariates were related to student math anxiety. So this implies that teachers math anxiety may not be the most effective target for intervention if we wanna decrease student math anxiety. And because there were such differences in terms of Richland's sample, both in age and location, we really think that future research needs to see if our results hold across different age levels and across different countries. 
In terms of our lab's work, our next steps involve looking at other teacher variables we've measured, like instructional practices in the classroom, and also other student attitudes. So not only anxiety, but also math confidence and math interest. So I'd like to thank my co-authors, everyone at the Math Thinking and Learning Lab, and IES for funding this research. Um, if you have any questions later on, my contact information is there, but um, if we have time, I'm happy to take questions now too. Thank you very much, Rachel. Well done also with the timing, really. And uh, I, I actually enjoy very much the, your talk. So I think we have like a question for you uh, from Cherry. So if you want, Cherry, you want to switch on your microphone and ask this question yourself, or I can read it for you. I have my mic on, I can do that. Uh, great job, Rachel, thank you. Um, I was just wondering if the teacher variables, if you check to see if they were related to student anxiety in the fall semester, in fall 2018. They did not predict uh, stu student math anxiety in the spring. Yeah, we did not. Um, we, we probably should test it. I think given the fall and spring math anxiety were so related for students, I would be surprised if they were related. And also because those students in the fall had only had those teachers for a couple of weeks. So if they were related, um, I, I can't think of a mechanism for them being related other than sort of coincidence. Um, because they really had only been in school for a very short period of time at that point with that teacher in particular. That makes sense. Thank you so much, Rachel. Thank you, Cheryl. We have another quite a few questions, but we have the time for another one. I will ask Chris and Renee to type there on the chat. I ask uh, Anz to switch on the mic and uh, ask the, the question. Yeah, I had, a, I had actually the same question if the relationship between teacher anxiety and student anxiety was mediated by the fall, by the fall data, and it was already answered. So Christoph or Renee can ask a question. Okay, Christ, up to you then. Uh, just super brief one. Uh, like, I would really love to read it. Is it already published, or is it coming, or is there a preprint or anything? Um, no, so we just um, pre-registered sort of a, a larger set of analyses um, based on this data this week, or it may not be pre-registered yet, but it will be in the next couple of days. Um, so um, it'll, it'll be a little while before it comes out, but um, we can certainly share any findings that you're particularly interested in if you just get in touch with myself or colleague. Thanks. Thank you again, Rachel. I think you will have an additional question for you in the chat. So okay. I think we can now move on with our last presentation. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm struggling to find the stop sharing screen button. Um... Oh, there we go. Thank you for whoever did that. Thank you, Rachel. I'm now passing the baton to Julia, our last speaker. So Julia, when you are ready. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. In this presentation, I will give the topic of self-perception of math abilities in children. Academic self-perception, call it also academic self is the belief and feelings or conception of one's for math abilities, we can find a positive moreover McWilliams and colleagues found that math is a first Julia Julia I'm sorry but 
Julie, I don't know if you can hear us, but there is some internet issue. Uh, we can hear you very, very badly. And you froze right now, actually. I In literature, we can find uh, if the phenomenon related to. Yes. Julia, can you hear us? Julia, I think we have a problem with Julia internet connections. Can you listen to me? No, Julia, not at all. It, you're, it's, it's really difficult to, to hear what you're saying. Your, your voice is very metallic. Maybe if yeah. she tries to connect again, she tries yeah. to leave and then come back. Yes, I listen to you. I don't know if she can hear us either. Okay, probably she. No, she disconnected. And I don't know. I hope that Julia will will join us soon. But yeah, thank you, Renee. <laughs> she was looking forward for this presentation. Actually, she, she was practicing the entire week. So I'm I'm really sorry for her because now for sure she will be even more nervous than before. <laughs> uh, I don't know, we can maybe wait two more minutes to see if she will be able to, to join us again. Okay. I'm really sorry, now you can hear me? Yeah. Okay. So sorry. Do not worry, Julia, it can happen. So I re quickly restart. In this presentation, uh, I want to deep the topic of self perception of math abilities in children. In literature, academic self perception, called also academic self concept, is uh, defined as the belief in and feelings or perception of one's own academic skills and achievements. This self perception has direct and indirect effect on uh, academic achievement. Specifically for math, we can find a positive correlation between math self-perception and math achievement. Moreover, McWilliams and colleague found that math self-perception more strongly relates to math achievement than academic self-perception. This is uh, perfectly in line with the specificity principle that states that uh, a domain-specific self-perception should be used to predict the achievement in that subject. In literature, we can find a mm, specific phenomenon relative to self-concept that is called positive illusory bias, PID. This is an overestimation of own academic abilities. This phenomenon in literature is mainly related to ADHD traits, and it is measured as the discrepancy between children's perception and external indicators. So for example, teacher perception or real measure of abilities. The, so the higher is the PIB, represent an overestimation of children's own abilities. Several past studies try to um, understand the nature of the PIB. 
but they mainly focus their attention on general academic competence and not to a specific perception, for example, in a specific subject. Moreover, previous studies use external indicators of ability and not a real ability measures. Finally, despite in literature, it is considered that executive function could have a role in, the, in this uh, PIB, Previous studies rarely considered them with the performance measures. Based on this, the main goal of the present study was to deep the accuracy of math cell perception in general math competencies and during a specific task. In this presentation, I'll call general mathematical PIB, referring to the overestimation of math cell perception in general math competencies. Instead, I'll say the specific mathematical PIB referring to the um, cell perception during a specific math task. Moreover, we take into account ADHD traits, real math performance, and executive function that are some of the main predictors of this uh, PIB. Specifically, the um, the research question are what are the main predictors of these two PIB and the two PIB and how much of the variance in these two PIBs accounted for ADHD traits, real math competencies or executive function deficit. Moreover, we want to understand if there is a mediating role of math abilities or executive function in the relation between ADHD traits and the two PIB. For this research, we enrolled five primary schools in the north of Italy. We collect data from 325 typical development children for, from a four and five grades. In the first phase, we assess the IQ with the Cattle Culture Fair Intelligence Test and processing speed abilities with the two subtests, coding and stable search from the WISC-4. In the second phase, we assess the two PIB, math abilities, executive function, and attention deficit and hyperactivity traits. As said before, the, two, the PIB is measured as the discrepancy between self perception and the, uh, an external rate of uh, competence. So, the general mathematical PAB was assessed with the scores from two parallel versions of a math self-competence scale completed by both children and teacher. This questionnaire is composed by 10 items and it is adapted from the self-perception profile for children by Arthur. Instead, the specific uh, mathematical PAB was assessed with difference between children objective performance on a mental calculation task composed by 48 equations and their own assessment after each given solution. On each calculation, the subject was instructed to choose the correct answer among four and to answer how confident he is about his answer. To assess ADHD traits, we propose the Connors Teaching Rating Scale, a clinical questionnaire for teacher to assess attention, deficit, and hyperactivity traits. Math abilities were assessed with two standardized battery to evaluate written calculation and math, math fluency. And finally, executive function abilities were assessed with uh, four new computerized tasks to evaluate uh, visual attention abilities uh, in which it is asked to select the target stimuli, inhibition ability with a gonna go task, working memory ability in which it was asked to reorder letter and number, and finally a planning, uh, planning abilities with a task uh, in which the child had to reproduce a picture in a given number of steps. So to answer to our first question, so what are the main predictors of the two PIB? 
we ran two regression analyses. In the first step, we include gender, uh, we include demographic variables and uh, processing speed index. Subsequently, we introduce ADHD traits, math abilities, and executive function. About the general mathematical PAB, our variable accounted for the 15% of the variance. Both ADHD traits and math abilities explain the 7% of the variance. About a specific mathematical PAB, our variable accounted for the 30% of the variance. ADHD traits explain only the 5% of the variance, whereas math ability explain the biggest part. In neither of the two PAB, executive function have a role. To answer to our second question, so if executive function or math abilities can mediate the relation among ADHD traits and the two PIB, we ran two mediation analyses. In the first one, we can observe as only math abilities have an indirect effect on general mathematical PIB. Instead, about the specific mathematical PIB, both executive function and math abilities mediate the relation between ADHD traits and the specific mathematical PIB. In conclusion, from our result, we can say that ADHD traits had a role in both the PIB. So there is an overestimation related to ADHD traits. Moreover, we found a significant indirect effect of uh, ADHD traits on both PIB via math abilities. This is in line with the ignorance of incompetence hypothesis. According to this hypothesis, if someone is incompetent in a specific domain, have also difficulties in um, evaluate own performance. Finally, we found a significant indirect effect of uh, ADSD traits on specific mathematical PAB via executive function. This partially confirmed the neuropsychological hypothesis that underline as executive function deficit can have a role in the, um, in, uh, the difficulty of uh, evaluate themselves in specific tasks as confirmed in other clinical population. Despite the interesting findings of our research, further research is needed to confirm our result. First of all, we include only typical development children. Moreover, we didn't assess for protective factors, for example, self-esteem. And also we include only participants from four and five grades. So maybe in future study, we can include several classes from different grades to understand the contribution of age in uh, this PIB. Thank you so much. Thank you, Julia. Great talk. And uh, I'm happy that you were able to connect and uh, uh, successfully deliver uh, your presentation in a perfect time. Thank you, all of you, to stay, to be here. Uh, with us, even if we are like running a few minutes late uh, uh, for comparing our usual time, as Andy nicely wrote in the just wrote in the chat, there is some question for Julia. We have one talk, for, uh, the time for one talk for her. Sorry, one question for her. Yeah, I have a brief question. Uh, on, can I ask something? Uh, yeah. Uh, um, and this questionnaire for estimating the self concepts in math, uh, was it developed specifically for children or can it be also applied to adult population? Some authors uh, try to identify it also in adolescents, for example, but uh, they found that uh, this self concept is different Maybe because the background factors, they hypothesize that uh, background factors can uh, more influence the self-concept uh, in the next, uh, next years. 
so it's getting more complicated over the years, right? Okay. Yes, exactly. Thank you for your question. Yeah, and pro probably, you know, maybe there are some instruments uh, to assess the same map concept in adults, or maybe some scales, some specific scales can be used some questions. No, no, unfortunately not complete scale, because uh, we developed this scale for this study, because uh, other scale are only composed by few items uh, or using other population. Uh, so honestly, I don't know if there is a specific scale for this. OK, thank you. Thank you. Huh? Thank you again, everybody. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, all the speaker, the brilliant speakers. And uh, I will just briefly mention that three of them are graduate students. So really well done to all of you. Um, now, just to wrap up, uh, I'd like to thank you again, all the organizing committee. And uh, I um, would like to hope uh, um, to, I, I hope to see you in the next upcoming events. And I wish a great summer to, to you all. Thank you again for your patience and uh, your kindness to stay, even if we are a little bit in late. Bye, everybody.